Sullivan Kaufman. I'm at Adkins Arboretum in Ridgely, Maryland today, and I want to introduce you to the skunk cabbage, Simplicarpus fetidus. In the spring, in wet, mucky soils of woods and thickets, the enormous leaves of skunk cabbage unfurl. You most frequently find skunk cabbage along swampy floodplains, but you may also find them on a wet hillside where a spring keeps the soil moist. Skunk cabbage flowers begin to develop underground during the summer, so that they're ready to emerge when there's a stretch of slightly warmer than normal temperatures in winter. They'll even emerge through the snow. I've seen some beginning to emerge in late December and early January here in Maryland. Nature writer Nelcha Blanchin Doubleday, in her book Nature's Garden, published in 1917, wrote, This despised relative of the stately calla lily proclaims spring in the very teeth of winter, being the first bold adventurer above ground. When the lovely hepatica, the first flower worthy the name to appear, is still wrapped in her fuzzy furs, the skunk cabbage's dark, incurved horn shelters within its hollow, tiny, malodorous florets. Typical of plants in the Araceae or Arum family, the flower is made up of a spathe and spadix. The hood-like spathe is a modified leaf that protects the flower-bearing spadix. The spathe is typically four to six inches long and a dark purple mottled with green. The petalless flowers are packed near the base of the two to five inch long knob-like spadix. Each flower has both male and female parts, but the female pistils emerge before the male stamens to avoid self-pollination. Skunk cabbage flowers have the remarkable ability to thermoregulate, a characteristic they share with a few other flowers in the Araceae family, including philodendron and dranunculus. In skunk cabbage, the spadix increases its respiration rate when temperatures fall, thereby generating heat in a process called thermogenesis. The energy source is starch stored in the roots of the plant. More specifically, they have a slightly different pathway for respiration within the mitochondria called cyanide-resistant respiration. They can maintain heat up to 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit for about a week unless ambient temperatures drop too low. The spadix produces heat as the eggs and pollen in the flowers are maturing. The heat may help to attract pollinators both by diffusing the skunky odor of the flowers and by offering a warm place for pollinators to shelter. Spiders will often shelter in the spathe too, waiting for unwary pollinators. As you might expect, the most common pollinators are flies and gnats, but honeybees have been seen collecting pollen too. In Asia, rove beetles and mosquitoes have also been observed with pollen on them. The genus name Simplocarpus comes from the Greek simplikos, connected, and karpos, fruit, connection of the ovaries into a compound fruit. Each fruit has 20 to 30 pea-sized seeds. The seeds are protected by a flesh coating containing calcium oxalate crystals. Few, if any, animals seem to eat the seeds, and most germinate near the parent plant unless they're carried away by floodwaters. Contractile roots pull the stem down into the wet, mucky soils until the stem is completely below ground. A large central root can be a foot long and three to six inches wide, surrounded by a mass of fibrous roots. All those roots make it hard to dig them up. The plants are also very long lived, with some living more than 200 years. The large leaves form a basal rosette, meaning that the leaves grow off of the central stem. The large leaves shade the ground, possibly lessening competition from other plants. The leaves provide shelter for many animals, including frogs, lizards, and even birds. Jack Sanders, in The Secrets of Wildflowers, writes that the yellow throat warbler sometimes builds its nest in the hollow of the spathe, using the foul odor to mask its own scent and discourage investigation by four-footed predators. The leaves contain calcium oxalate crystals, making them unpalatable to many animals, but they are eaten by slugs and snails and by the ruby tiger moth and the cattail borer moth. Bears sometimes dig up the roots to eat when they emerge from hibernation in spring, but then they're known to eat almost anything emerging from hibernation. Leaves die by late summer and quickly decay. The genus Simplicarpus has what is called a circumboreal distribution. In this case, they occur in both Eastern Asia and parts of North America, skipping Northern Europe and Western North America. These may be one species or several, depending on which taxonomist you consult. 
but Kew Gardens Plants of the World Online list five species. Our species is thought to have migrated over the Bering Land Bridge at some point in the distant past. It now ranges from Minnesota into Canada and as far south as Tennessee and North Carolina. Another related genus occurs in western North America, Lysichiton americanus, the western skunk cabbage or swamp lantern. Skunk cabbage was used medicinally by many Native American tribes. The leaves were used in poultices and the dried roots for treating whooping cough and relieving toothaches, among other things. Calcium oxalate was removed by either drying roots in the sun or by repeatedly boiling the leaves. The dried roots were even made into flour. Henry David Thoreau found inspiration in the early appearance of the skunk cabbage shoots. He wrote in his journal in October of 1857, if you are afflicted with melancholy at this season, go to the swamp and see the brave spears of skunk cabbage buds already advanced toward a new year. Their gravestones are not bespoken yet. Is it the winter of their discontent? Do they seem to have lain down to die despairing of skunk cabbagedom? Up and at em, give it to em. Excelsior, put it through, these are their mottos. Mortal human creatures must take a little respite in this fall of the year. Their spirits do flag a little. There is a little questioning of destiny and thinking to go like cowards to where the weary shall be at rest. But not so with the skunk cabbage. Are these false prophets? Is it a lie or a vain boast underneath the skunk cabbage bud, pushing it upward and lifting the dead leaves with it? They rest with spears advanced. They rest to shoot. See those green cabbage buds lifting the dry leaves in that watery and muddy place. There is no cant or cant to them. They see over the brow of winter's hill. They see another summer ahead. Mm -hmm.